Welcome to Experimental, the science show that gives sheep a hard time yeah. and turns snails on. Coming up, will this man drown in welly boots? And is this fish farting or trying to tell you something? But first, let's see what happens when computer games break out of the computer. Worried mothers, ambitious politicians and self-important doctors all like nothing better than a loud moan on the subject of how video games are turning our children into couch potatoes. So we're pleased to have located a scientist, Dr Chuk of the Nanyang Technological University in Singapore, who has managed to take the video game off the couch and onto the street, literally. Welcome to the world's first augmented reality video game. I realised that we've reached kind of a point in uh, gaming where it's actually it's actually removing interaction between people and I really wanted to change that bring the gaming back into the real world so you actually once again we're socializing and playing together to achieve this feat Dr Chuk first turned to augmented reality something that he had already been working on it's technology that allows computer images to be seen against the backdrop of the real world to develop this system, we need to merge the real world and the virtual world. So what we do is we create this uh, head mount display system where you put this uh, device on your eyes. So what you can do is actually you can see the real world but all the virtual objects on top of it as well. The computer knows where to place its images in the real world thanks to a tiny motion sensor, which can track your head movement in three directions. And it's not just for tabletop battles. For education, we're actually developing a kind of mixed reality classroom for children. They'll be able to see solar systems or history or evolution on their tabletop and be able to learn using this, all this 3D mixed reality information. But how did Dr Chuk get from mixing real and computer images on a tabletop to a street gaming child slimming concept? Meters, turn left to Dyersol Avenue. You know that annoying little voice in the car? 300 metres, turn left and turn left. Yes, that's right, sat nav. He realised that by combining it with his augmented reality system, he and his friends could take to the streets and play their own version of Pac-Man. But there's one tiny problem. Unfortunately, most kind of consumer GPS systems are only accurate for about five to 10 meters. So we use a RTK GPS system. Normal GPS uses signals bounced off satellites to track a position. However, it's only accurate to within a few meters. RTK, or real-time kinematics, uses a ground station in addition to the satellites. Because the ground station is nearby, the RTK system is accurate to within a few centimetres. Perfect for chasing your mates with pinpoint accuracy. With his new super accurate guidance system, Dr Chuk could finally realise his dream of playing Pac-Man outside in the fresh air. And his first battleground, the university car park. You put on your wearable computer and your head mount display and then suddenly your real world becomes transformed. And so you actually now are ex uh, experiencing a kind of game where you feel like you've picked up your body and put it into a Pac-Man game. Let the games begin. The idea is to spot virtual yellow dots hanging in mid-air. Run around, gobbling them up. Meanwhile, your playing partner is after you. When she looks through her goggles, she sees you as a big yellow blob. And her job is to ignore the dots, track you down and eat you up. After that, it's game over. Ah! 
<laughs> it's just a prototype at the moment, but in the future, games like these may be just the thing to get lazy kids off the sofa and playing in the middle of the road again, just like the old days. Although, judging by the games they play now, Dr Chuck had better make sure his equipment doesn't break easily. <laughs> she got me. She got me. In a moment, we'll be dragging sheep and feeding snails Prozac. But first, let's have a drink in the test department. The test department would like to show you how to open a bottle of wine with a large tree. First, ask the owner of the tree if it's OK to nail some padding to it. If not, use tape to secure the padding. The padding will stop the bottle smashing and protect the tree. Then, wearing gloves and eye protection just in case, start to bang the bottom of the bottle against the tree. Oh, go on. You can do it harder than that. No, go on. Even harder. Oh, not that hard, though. What happens is that the shock of the wine bottle hitting the tree is transferred through the wine itself and then hits the bottom of the cork. After about 30 seconds of banging, the cork will be knocked out by the shockwave. Very practical. Yeah. Coming up on Experimental, why some fish fart? And why some toads are more slippery than others? But before we answer that great question, let's go and wrestle with some hairy beasties. Outback Australia, land of more than 100 million sheep, and every one of them in need of an annual haircut. If it's bad for the sheep, how much worse for the shearers? Giving more than 200 short back and sides a day makes the shearer's job one of the toughest in the world. As occupational safety engineer John Culverner explains. Shearing is a rag bag of uh, occupational hazards. The sheep shearers experience a rate of injuries many times uh, that of the average worker in Australia. Sheep are heavy, greasy and alive. And every one of them has to be picked up onto its back and dragged out of the pen to the shearing station. Apparently, what you're dragging them across can make all the difference. Shearer Bob Kirkpatrick sheared his first sheep at the age of 11. When you start dragging them out, you've uh, got hold of their uh, front legs, one hand on each front leg, and you're dragging the sheep with its full weight across the batons. The saying was that Australia was riding on the sheep's back, but I think all along they were riding on the shearers' backs as well. So Culverner and his team dedicated themselves to discovering ways to save the shearers' back by making life a little easier. They set out to scientifically measure the best surface to drag a sheep on, and Experimental decided to do the same. We connected our sheep shearer, Brent Nash, to a heart rate monitor and measured his pulse rate as he dragged 20 sheep over three different surfaces. First, a flat floor made of wooden battens. Batten direction is, of course, vital. In Bob's day, they ran crossways. Now, with the, uh, the batten going crosswood, if the sheep's kicking at all, you can get a grip on the board and throw your back this way. Whereas, if the battens are running this way in the catch and pen, there's nothing at all for the sheep to catch its back feet on. Fascinating. And the heart rate for the traditional wooden floor was? 161. Not bad. Next, the mesh floor. As far as dragging sheep on a mesh floor goes, it's, it's a lot harder, and I suspect the explanation is that the sheep can have a lot of grip. 
There's a lot of uh, resistance there as you're, you're dragging out the, the wool's catching on the mesh. So I'd say it's not a it's not a very good option for a catching pen floor. Heart rate 166. A bit high that. Finally, what may be the biggest thing in shearing since the invention of sheep. All the gripless advantages of the wood floor, but with added slope. Once you've got the momentum up, the sheep's actually coming with you, and then uh, you're out on the board, and uh, it's a lot easier. And that's not the only reason sheep handlers like a sloping floor. Apparently, there's nothing they like to see more than a load of sheep's bottom. The natural defence of a sheep seems to be to walk uphill. So if the catching pen has a slope away from the door, then the sheep tend to look the other way. So, surprising a sheep from behind makes them easier to catch. And heart rate for the sloping wooden floor was... 158. Victory for the sloping floor. New hope for shearers everywhere and a major breakthrough for Australian science. Proof that gravity works, even down under. And finally, for anyone hoping to repeat this experiment at home, here's a last word of advice from Bob. If you hold a sheep properly, or quietly or tenderly, like I'm holding this one, it's all right. But you hold them a bit rough, they're like a sheila, they'll never forgive you. In a moment, snails on drugs. But first, let's try and drown Horace in the test department. It's often said that if you fall into the water with Wellington boots on, they'll fill up and pull you to the bottom. Let's apply a bit of science to the theory. First, how much does a welly boot full of water weigh? Six kilos. Now the scientific experiment. Let's see if our demonstrator drowns when he attempts to swim in the wellies. Oh, that's a bit disappointing. It's a bit splashy, but he's definitely not heading for the bottom. Why? Well, partly because the boot is largely full of foot, not water, but there's another reason the prophets of doom have forgotten. Let's weigh those boots again. Only 500 grams. Why? Because water in water weighs, well, pretty much the same as the water that's around it. Don't try this at home. Still to come on Experimental, Dr Fong will turn on his snails. Whilst the test department will measure the friction coefficient of the African fire-bellied toad. Scotland, land of rugged mountains, mist-shrouded glens and... <laughs> Very disturbing noises coming out of the lochs. Noises that sound a bit rude. At Dunstaff Nage Marine Laboratory near Oban on Scotland's west coast, two scientists, Drs Ben Wilson and Bob Batty, are up late doing weird things to a tank full of herring, determined to discover whether fish fart. A few months earlier, Wilson had been playing sounds to Herring. He wasn't expecting the fish to reply. I wasn't actually trying to record sounds from the fish. I was interested in how they responded to sounds that I was making, but I was just monitoring the noise that was in the tank anyway. And then while I was doing it one evening, I had the lights down low, I was getting ready for my experiment, I had my finger on the play button ready to play one of the sounds, and all of a sudden there was this loud... well, farting sound. And immediately I thought, a uh, practical joke of somebody else in the lab mucking around. So I flicked the lights on and there was nobody around. It was just me and the fish and that was it. Mysteriously, whenever the lights went on, the farting stopped. I became convinced that it was the fish, but they were only doing it when they had the lights out and things were dark and I couldn't actually see what they were doing. If he were to prove his fish were farting, Dr Wilson would have to catch them at it. He didn't have the gear to film underwater in the dark. Luckily, he knew a man who did. Time to call Dr Bob Batty. 
my reaction uh, was, um, well, laughter at first, because Ben played this sound to me over the telephone. And uh, it, it just sounds ridiculous when you hit the phone. What did it sound like? Well, like a high-pitched raspberry. <laughs> So Wilson and Batty set up their infrared lights and underwater cameras and kept watch over the herring, deep into the wee hours. That's working out right. And after hours in the dark, patiently monitoring their wind instruments, Wilson and Batty sent victory. It was a really exciting moment. Finally, there it was. We actually had on the video the fish, bubbles coming out of its anal pore, and we had the sound as well. We realised that that's exactly what's happening. It was quite an exciting moment. Success at last. They'd finally caught the herring farting. But being scientists, they needed a more formal term for the phenomenon. I thought, we can't really call it a fart sound. It sounds like a fast, repetitive tick, and the acronym for that is FRT, so we thought that would stick. And stick it did. But this wasn't the time to celebrate. Two big questions remained. How and why were the herring farting? Perhaps clues lay in how the herrings spend their day. Wilson and Batty turned their attention to the swim bladder, the herring's buoyancy control organ. During the day, herrings school at depth, but at night, they migrate up to the water's surface and gulp in air to refill their swim bladders. Perhaps the herring we're using the organ as an underwater whoopee cushion. Wilson and Batty already knew that herring release bubbles, sometimes lots of them, especially when there are predators about. Fishermen have known about it for a very long time. You can tell a school of fish at sea because you see a, a, a slick on the water where these bubbles get to the surface and then you can go and catch, catch herring. And they also produce them when they're attacked by predators like killer whales and so on. They'll produce streams of bubbles uh, from, the, from the swim bladder. When threatened, herring can release large amounts of the air in their swim bladders in one quick burst. No one is really sure how the bubbles thwart the killer whales. Perhaps they interfere with the hunter's echolocation. Or perhaps, by dumping air, the herring are able to dive faster to take them out of harm's way. Good. Do you want to listen? Yes, please. Wilson and Batty knew that they didn't have a killer whale in their tank, so it couldn't be a fear response. And besides, they were only getting a few bubbles and only at night. The scientists were baffled. And then they remembered the herring only fart in company. The number of fart sounds that you record is proportional to the number of fish in the tank. So the more fish you have, the more FRT sounds per fish you get. So they only produce these sounds when they're in company. And that suggests to me that it's got some sort of social communicative kind of function. And what happens at night is these fish disperse. And there's a big question lurking. How do they stay in touch with each other so that when they can start schooling again in the morning? And one of the ways they might do that is to make these sounds. So unlike you and me, herring only fart in company. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Farts are a social thing. Hmm. I wonder if herring can smell. Still to come on Experimental, something for the gamblers amongst you. But first, something a little less racy. Hello! Welcome to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. The home of biologist Dr Peter Fong and 500 of his favourite subjects. Water snails. Snails he loves to give erections by dosing them with mind-altering drugs. But why? Scientists often do have crazy minds, but actually there is some real science behind this, and that is that these snails are hosts for an important human parasite. The snails, which live in the tropics, are host to the larvae of a parasitic worm. Once the worm develops, it leaves the snail and lives in the water until it meets up with an unsuspecting human foot, whereupon it gnaws its way into the flesh, eventually infesting the abdomen and liver. Ultimately, their eggs are secreted in human urine, eaten by the snails, and the whole process starts again. Now, if that worm uh, 
is in your body for a long time, it can eventually kill you. So the point of Dr Fong's research is to find ways of reducing the snail's numbers by breaking the cycle of the worm's development. And that's where the erections come in. Now, most scientists would get out the poison and zap them dead, but not Dr Fong. He wanted to find a way of knocking them out in the kindest way possible. For this experiment, I'm drugging the snails with Prozac. Now, in humans, a dose of Prozac is known as the happy drug, designed to make you feel good. But what happens when you give an antidepressant to a snail? Does it kill it dead? <gasps> Does it make it crawl round in circles in a happy kind of way? No, none of these things. In humans, Prozac causes sexual dysfunction. In these snails, if you give them Prozac, it gives them a full erection of the penis. Being snails, getting a stiffy takes a little time. 12 hours, to be precise. So whilst we're waiting, a little anatomy lesson. Snails are hermaphrodite, which means that the same snail can be female one moment and male the next. With a great big shell covering their nether regions, the sexual organs, their penis and vagina, are located just behind the head. And if the snail decides to be male, it sprouts this massive horn-shaped knob. And sure enough, 12 hours after the squirt of Prozac, all Dr Fong snails are in their male mode. All of them standing at attention, which can last for up to 48 hours. Great for the snail, but how is a weekend hard-on going to contribute to their demise? When they copulate, one typically acts like a male, and the other typically acts like a female. And that's the key to Dr Fong's research. Because not only do most of the snails decide to stiffen up in a male sort of way when exposed to Prozac, but the resulting member is impotent. Large, but totally useless as an instrument of reproduction. If we can stop them from reproducing, then perhaps we can limit the number of snails and limit the parasitic infections that um, are caused by uh, worms that live in these snails and are parasites to humans. Dr Fong's long-term hope is that he can find a drug that turns Prozac's 48-hour stiffy into a lifelong and ultimately species-controlling hard-on. If he does, then much of the tropics might be rid of a debilitating disease. Finally, to the test department for the great toad conundrum. In the test department, our demonstrators are having a well-earned rest. They couldn't afford to buy a racehorse, so they opted to lose their monopoly money on the sport of zoologists. Frog and toad racing. On the right, a white tree frog. And on the left, a fire-bellied toad. Well, the tree frog is obviously faster than the fire-bellied toad. But now the racing is over, the question on the test department's minds is, which one is stickier? As this is real science we're doing here, there are no bets on the outcome. All we're interested in is ascertaining the hard facts behind interspecies amphibian stickiness. Until today, a gaping hole in human knowledge. A gap which we will fill with our amphibian adhesiveness monitor. But why are frogs and toads sticky in the first place? It's all to do with the fact that frogs not only breathe through their mouths, they also breathe through their skin, directly into their blood vessels. The moisture they secrete from special glands helps in this unique way of breathing, but it also makes them slippery. So is one of our little racers slippier than the other? Let's find out. Up they go on the adhesion monitor. It's pretty close, and the frog and toad adhere with equal measure. But hang on, it looks like the tree frog has hit the slippery slope. Suddenly it finds its fourth legs and starts to ascend rather than slip. So there we have it. Conclusive evidence that the white tree frog is stickier than the fire-bellied toad. <laughs>